Right, hiya. Thanks for tuning in. This is uh, Terry's All Bikes and this video, as promised in my last wild camping, camping video, is going to be about wild camping um, in places like this. Now, I do quite a bit of wild camping. If you follow my channel, you'll know that. Um, normally I use the Brompton um, and do it as a bike packing adventure. Um, but wild camping, stealth camping, whether you do it by bike or on foot, it's the same sort of thing you need to look at. Now, I became aware that um, a lot of people have a lot of reservations about wild camping. So I put a post on the Brompton Touring Group Facebook page, a uh, page that I started and run along with Andrew Marshall from Nottinghamshire Madness uh, YouTube channel that you may be aware of. Um, asking the question as to people's thoughts on wild camping and stealth camping. Any concerns they might have, any fears they might have, anything particularly like about it. The overriding sort of feedback was for um, people who are more concerned than anything about being caught. Of course, wild camping is illegal in the UK or the majority of the UK. Scotland's a different subject and there are a couple of places in England, Dartmoor and some areas in the um, Lake District that are either where it's either legal or a blind eye is turned to it. Other than that, it's strictly, um, it's, it's, it's illegal. You shouldn't be doing it. But lots of people do. And if it's done responsibly, then you make your own decision as to whether or not that's what you want to do. I'm not gonna be talking about the legalities of it and such today. It's, it's, about, it's about addressing the concerns that people have. On the Facebook page there, um, I'll just run through a few of the comments that I got. Um, Dee said that, um, got all the gear, just need the time to commit. Um, Rebecca said, I've been wild camping twice in Wales, um, bikepacking almost in remote spots with an early start. Not something I'm massively confident about now. A sole female facing an angry landowner isn't something to look forward to. Okay. Stuart said, there seems to be an increase in stories of wild campers leaving a mess. So if you do, make sure you leave the place as you find it and don't light fires. Absolutely, leave no trace. Where are we? Um, some questions about gear and such. Again, I'm not looking at gear in this. It's, it's, it's just about the practicalities of doing it and trying to lay some of the fears that you may have about it. I tried it once and was all excited, but once I was pitched and settled in my tent, I suddenly felt scared and alone. I started thinking, what's that noise? What was that? The thoughts then developed into, what if something happens? There's no one around. Okay, so that's, that's an idea of some of the concerns that people had um, or have. And, and that's the sort of thing I'm gonna be addressing in this video. If that's of interest to you, stay with me. Right, so I typically, what I'm going to guide you through is what I do. And I typically um, plan for a, a wild camp over one or two nights. I, um, I research where I'm going first. And I've had some amazing camps doing it this way. Uh, I have also camped out of necessity, um, doing longer tours and such. And it's just where you, where you tip up at the end of the night looking for somewhere to stay. But what I'm going to be talking about here is planning a camp, which if you're setting out in wild camping, I recommend you do first. Don't set off on a bike ride or a hike and needing to find a camp that night if you've never done it before or you're not very experienced at it. Um, you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself to succeed and, and it, it can be difficult. So we're looking at planning. So the first thing in planning a site, you may already have somewhere in mind you've seen, you've visited previously and thought what a wonderful place that would be to camp. If so, yeah, crack on and do that. If not, your first port of call is maps. I got more maps than, than I, sh I should have, either cycling maps or um, Odin survey maps there. Maps are a great resource for looking out for places if you're looking for somewhere new. Now, 
when I'm looking for places to camp, as I said in the introduction there, a lot of people are concerned about being caught camping because it's illegal, okay? I, I don't camp on farmland unless, other than from necessity. I don't camp on private estates or anything like that, country houses or whatever, again, unless it was from necessity and I was absolutely stuck. So where do I camp? What sort of places do I plan to camp? The two main places I camp would either be forests and woods, and I look for woodlands that are owned by the Forestry Commission, or on open land, uh, open access land. Open access land is in the UK is land where you are allowed to be, so you're allowed to roam freely there, but you're not allowed to camp. Okay, now why do I do that? Well, the reason for that is that you're not going to bump into an angry landowner. Open access land, there could be a landowner there, but very often it's owned by the National Trust. So that's another thing to look out for. If you're, if you're looking at an area to camp of open land, much of it is owned by the National Trust. If it's owned by the National Trust, the only person with any authority to move you on is gonna be a National Trust employee. They're not normally roaming around the moors and the heaths and the hills in the evening, just before dusk. I've never come across an employee of the National Trust there. It's the same with forests and forestry commission land. The chances of you bumping into an employee of the forestry commission in a forest as it's going dark are extremely slim. Now, I have been seen many times setting up camp or once camp's been set up, people have passed me, people have seen me. Particularly because I travel on the Brompton, it means I'm not getting a long way from footpaths and such. It's, um, you know, you've got to physically manhandle the bike. If you're bikepacking, your chances of getting further away from footpaths and to the more remote spots are obviously going to be easier. The more remote the spot, the better in lots of ways. But as I say, I have been seen on many occasions. It's never been an issue. It's normally dog walkers or hikers, the occasional mountain biker. Now, when I've met these people, they either completely ignore me or stop for a chat. Every single person that has ever stopped for a chat has done it from a point of view of being interested in what I'm doing, it's something possibly that they do, that they've thought about, they're just interested in it. So yeah, don't be worried if you do get seen. Don't think um, someone's seen you from a distance or you, you better pack up your tent and move on. Um, it's not likely to be a problem. Um, on that, obviously the normal rules apply, as in, in the vast majority of cases, you set up camp as close to dusk as you can. And um, in the morning, I love getting up to see a sunrise anyway, assuming there is a sunrise, obviously it depends on the time of the year and the weather, but two of my favorite times on wild camping are sunrises and sunsets. Um, there's nothing finer in my book to, to have a beautiful area to yourself, which inevitably you have if you're wild camping. Um, last thing at night as the sun's setting it's, it's a fantastic experience and, and even better in the morning I've never seen anyone yet in the morning on a camp um, yeah no that is true a dog, a dog once found me but I don't think I've ever seen a, a, an actual person as I've been uh, up in the morning having my breakfast to see a sunrise and, and I've seen some fantastic sunrises and, and that's what it's about it, it, the, the, the feeling of being alone in a place right right so I just watched back the uh, video that I made earlier and um, I did sort of ramble a little bit there and lost, um, lost my train of thought and where I was going there's an important analogy I wanted to make for you regarding wild camping and one of the reasons why I think people feel uneasy when they're doing it. And one of the biggest things I think is unfamiliarity. It's not something that we're used to. Lots of us aren't used to spending time alone, maybe, or not outside of the house. 
um, in a very isolated sort of situation. Uh, an analogy I can make is between driving uh, and being in a car in general. That's probably the most dangerous thing most of us do on a daily basis. Three people a day are killed on the roads in the UK. 40,000 people a year in Europe are killed on the roads. Uh, but we don't, we're not afraid every time we get in the car. We don't get in the car worrying about what might happen because it's something that we do, many of us, on a daily basis and we become familiar with it. And that's part of the thing with, with wild camping. It's unfamiliar. The dangers of wild camping are probably considerably less than they are from driving. But we think about the dangers that there are and, and that's a concern to us. And that's something that you need to work on. There we go, dog walker stops play once again. Um, so what we're saying, yeah, so it, it's familiarity. It's becoming familiar with it as a, as a pastime, as something that you do. The more you do it, the easier it will get. Um, one of the people on Facebook there said the first time I did it, all excited, everything was great until he got in the tent and then started to think about hearing noises and what would happen if something went wrong. Um, Depending on the time of year, you could be spending an awful long time in the tent. I've camped in November now, it was dark at five o'clock. There's not an awful lot more to do other than be in your tent. And it doesn't come light until sort of seven, half seven thirty in the morning. That's a long time to spend in your tent. It's important that you have something to take your mind off what might be happening around you. Not that anything scary is happening around you, but it may feel scary. So download a movie, a podcast, um, some music to listen to, uh, a book to read, whatever relaxes you, whatever is going to distract you from the odd wind noise, the odd squawk of an owl or whatever it may be. And the more you do it, the more you become familiar with it, the more you hear those noises and nothing bad happens, the more comfortable you'll be with it. So I think that's a, a good analogy um, to compare it with driving. Driving is much more dangerous than wild camping in my experience. I know there are a lot less people wild camping than driving, but um, driving is a dangerous thing to do, but we don't worry about it. We don't think about it and overthink it. And I think a lot of us can overthink the wild camping experience as to what can go wrong. Yes, things can go wrong. Things can go wrong crossing the road to go to the local shop. Things can go wrong, but we don't worry about it because we do it on a regular basis. So just bear that one in mind. Now, going back to the fears that a lot of people have about wild camping. Now, one of the quotes on, on Facebook actually that I didn't get down to was one of the chaps was obviously concerned about werewolves. Now, if you are concerned about werewolves and vampires, and the ghouls that wander around at night, then there's not a lot I can say to possibly reassure you about that. That's something you have to make your own mind up about. But the normal sort of things, let's face it, in the UK, there are no animals that are going to hurt you. We don't have wolves, we don't have bears, we don't have anything that's going to hurt you. So if you do hear something scrambling about around the tent at night, and I have heard things, just reassure yourself, it's not going to hurt you. There's nothing in this country that's going to cause you any harm whatsoever. So that's not something to be concerned about. The thing about people finding us, as I said, we've dealt with that, I think, in that if you're camping in these sort of places, you don't need to worry about angry landowners. Um, it's not an issue. There isn't an angry landowner. If, if a member of their staff finds you, they're not likely to act um, irrationally and angrily. They may ask you to move on. It's extremely unlikely that's going to happen, but, but it's a possibility. But hopefully that allays some of the fears that you might have about being confronted by angry landowners, game wardens, that type of person that could be aggressive towards you. The other thing is, of course, once you camp in, as was alluded to a little bit earlier, we always follow the leave no trace philosophy. So we don't, don't light campfires, that's, that's it's not a good idea. I know some people have methods of doing that in woodlands um, and then burying the, 
the fire pit over where they've where they've had the fire pit and covering it with leaf mould and such so you can't see it. Well, that, that, that's fair enough if that's your thing and you can um, leave no trace in that way. I think you're still damaging the ground of the forest there. Arguable as to how much damage that causes the size of a forest and a small fire. Uh, make your own mind up about that. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, I would say don't have fires. One, you're damaging the land and two, you're increasing the chances of being found. If you are found by anyone, then that, that may give you an argument. Um, there are forest fires raging across Greece as we speak now, and um, it's not a good thing. They do happen in the UK as well, and it's not good that um, you could be either starting one or perceived to be in danger of starting one. However, in control of your fire, you may think you are. Don't take portable barbecues with you while camping. Um, use a proper camping stove if you're gonna be cooking and um, and they should be okay so that's that side of it um, i'm going to put up a few photos of um, some of the camps that i've done just to show you how fantastic some of these locations can be right so this first one here is up on top of the mendy pills that's the sun setting another one from that same camp fantastic spot that if you can get to the top of the hill um, the views and the sunsets and sunrises can be amazing. This one's on Dartmoor. This was on the Devon to Devon coast to coast route. Another one from that same camp there. This is just in a meadow that I that I found, um, side of some woodland. This, as you can see, is a coastal one, cliff top one there. That was fantastic, and um, that was facing west or on the west coast. So I've got an amazing sunset. And this one I did with my son up in uh, the Peak District. And again, this one was further north in uh, near a woodland near Sheffield. And there's a sunset over the River Severn. Absolutely fantastic. Right, so go going back to um, finding a location. So you've looked on maps. You've found a, an area that looks interesting. Maybe a hilltop. Um, it may be um, by a beach or forest, what, whatever it may be. Now your next step is to try and find out a little bit more information about that area. And the way that I would normally do that is if we may have started with paper maps or Google maps or whatever type of maps you're using, you can then, particularly if you're using Google maps, go into street view and often you will be able to click on that and see some closer up views of the area you're thinking of camping. This little clip is, um, Black Dam, which was my last wild camp um, a couple of weeks ago. Right, so you've already seen a couple of pictures of this on the photos that I showed there with the sunset. Um, yeah, this is the highest point in the Mendip, so you get a fantastic sunset, you also get a fantastic sunrise, um, weather permitting. Um, yeah, so a brilliant area. And you can see here, this is um, a 360 degree shot that you get of these places that someone's um, put on there kindly for us. There's another one just down the trail there, look. I'm just gonna click on that now and you can see what it's like just down the trail. So you can see the kind of area that you're gonna to arrive to. Gives you a little bit of pre-warning, pre a little bit of information what it looks like before you arrive. Right, so there we go. That's one way to get more information about where you're hoping to camp or thinking about camping. Another thing is to Google it on, uh, Google it, sorry, do a YouTube search. You may be thinking of going somewhere I've been or someone else has been. There are lots of popular wild camping sites. And um, if you can see someone else has been there, you get a feel for the place and uh, whether or not you think it, it's, it's gonna be for you. So yeah, YouTube is another great uh, resource. Maybe if you're stuck for ideas about where to go, just do a YouTube search in your area for wild camping and um, you may be surprised at what comes up so YouTube's a great resource for that so I will show you this spot where I'm sitting there we are it's somewhere where I'm thinking of coming for a wild camp stroke stealth camp it looks like we've had some idiots here, either kids starting fires or 
Looks more like kids starting fires than campfires, to be fair. So the reason I'm looking here, <laughs> apart clearly from that view, is that it's a relatively difficult place to get up to, up to just here where I'm at. And although there is housing over there, as you can see, this is much closer to housing than I would normally come. Um, it's more of a stealth camp, clearly. Oh, there we go. Visited by dogs. As I say, it's normally dog walkers, if you're going to be seen. I'll cut this short here while this lady passes through. Right, so there you go. Clearly, um, you can be seen. Um, I'm not camping today. I'm, I'm here to have a little recce of the campsite area that I'm, or the area I'm thinking of coming to camp in. And um, yeah, this is still somewhere that I would consider definitely. Um, once it's going dark, then someone like that lady uh, with the dogs there is extremely unlikely to come this way. Um, and again, if she did, it's, it's not her land. So, you know, she's not likely to be overly concerned about that if she did come this way and I was camped here. Um, on the practicalities of camping again, um, one of the people on the Facebook group there was concerned about noises in the night and such. Well, the majority of the noises you're going to hear are going to be if you're camping in a woodland. Woodlands are noisy places. The wind's blowing today, I'm sure you can pick that up from the mic. Hopefully the quality is not too bad with the uh, setup I'm using now. But um, yeah, most of the noises you're going to hear if you're wild camping are going to be in woodlands. Uh, the trees creak and groan and leaves rustle and there seems there's more wildlife in the woodland as well you might get the owls squawking um yeah you just seem to encounter a lot more wildlife and different noises in woodlands so if you think you're going to be worried about that then maybe woodlands is not a good place for your first early wild camps um there's something nice about having an open sky above you as well and i enjoy that far more than a woodland wild camp and um I enjoy the views um, as, as you will have seen from some of the photos there. Have a look through, back through some of my videos, some of the spots I've camped. Um, it's, it's not wild camping just for the sake of, of being wild camping. It, for me, the vast majority of the spots I choose, I choose because they're fantastic spots to be in. Um, I wake up with an amazing view um, more often than not. As I said, there are times where I'm on a uh, on a trip, um, did the coast to coast, Devon coast to coast last year, I've done the Way of the Roses, uh, Trans Pennine Trail and if you're doing a long distance trail like that then you can't necessarily plan exactly where you're going to camp in an evening and part of the beauty of being able to wild camp is that you, you don't have to plan, um, you, you can camp where you finish up that day and and, and that's a great thing and it's a good feeling of freedom and the joy of being able to do that. So in those instances, it, it, you can't necessarily have such a fantastic spot. But what I'm talking to you about today predominantly is the ability to plan a wild camp and pick somewhere fantastic. Pick somewhere fantastic. I know I've said on a couple of my videos, I'm, I've got a million dollar view. You could not get a hotel room with a view like some of the views that I've gone to bed to, woken up to. Um, you just couldn't, money can't buy it. It's fantastic and it's free. So respect the land, choose your site well, choose sites where you're not going to get in confrontation with landowners. If you're setting out, maybe don't, don't start with woodlands, start in open land, um, it, it is, you're more conspicuous, but you're not going to get the noises and everything at night so much if that's something that you're concerned about. Um, there are some good books if you're worried about werewolves and vampires and such as to how to ward them off. You know, 
um, people better qualified than me on that. So if that's a concern, um, just have a look at that. Hope this has been helpful for you. Hope it's um, allayed a few of your um, concerns. I am thinking of arranging a little wild camp on Dartmoor where it is legal through the Brompton Touring Group Facebook page. Um, if it's something, it's likely to be in September. If that's something you're interested in, um, either leave me a comment on here or um, on the Brompton Touring Group page. Look out for the post coming up for that. Um, anything you feel I've not covered today, anything, any queries, anything you're not sure about, please leave a comment. I always answer comments. And uh, I look forward to seeing you the next time. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks for joining me today.